Hi, I'm Matej Zaharia, and I'm going to talk about Lakehouse, a new generation of data analytics platforms emerging in the industry that unify data warehousing and advanced analytics and simultaneously tackle some of the big challenges with both of these. So to explain Lakehouse, I want to start with the history of data analytics platforms. And this begins in the 1980s with data warehouses. Uh, data warehouses were the first you know, purposely designed systems for analytics. And the idea was very simple. You would ETL data from all your operational databases into these systems that were optimized for SQL analytics. And they had rich management and performance features for that purpose, like schemas, indexes, and transactions, and so on, to let you get high performance analytics. The data warehouses were, of course, wildly successful and still are today. Uh, but uh, in the 2010s, they started to face some challenges. In particular, there were three new problems. Uh, first of all, data warehouses were great for tables and SQL, but they couldn't support unstructured and semi-structured data that was increasingly becoming common, like time series, logs, images, documents, and so on. Second, they had a high cost when storing large data sets because they were really optimized for uh, smaller ones. And third, uh, and perhaps most importantly, they didn't support data science, machine learning, and other kinds of advanced analytics that can't be expressed through SQL. You had to take all the data out and do that outside the warehouse, which is inefficient and error prone. So in the 2010s, a new kind of system uh, started being used together with data warehouses, which is data lakes. Uh, data lakes are low cost storage systems that can store raw data of any kind using a file interface. So things like Amazon S3 or HDFS. And you can put any data you want in them, usually, and the data is accessible through a file interface. Usually they're used with open file formats like Apache Parquet, uh, and that means that the data is also directly accessible to many engines that are not running SQL. For example, virtually all machine learning and data science um, engines used today can read from data lakes and are usually running against those. Um, and finally, you still want to do some SQL analytics on these, and you still want subsets of your data with transactions and management features. So for those, the common practice is to ETL part of your data into data warehouses and then do all that work in there. So today, this is the dominant architecture at uh, large enterprises, and the vast majority of data in an enterprise is in a data lake. Now, at first glance, this might seem like we've solved you know, all the problems. We have cheap storage. We can still get great management features on subset of the data. So what's wrong? Uh, but it turns out that this two-tier architecture, um, even though it's cheap to store, creates a lot of challenges that um, enterprises face. So the first challenge is data reliability. Unlike the first generation uh, warehouses, you now have multiple extra ETL steps to deal with the data lake and multiple storage systems and formats um, and engines involved in processing your data. And all these ETL steps that load data into your warehouse can go wrong or can introduce bugs. And these reduce data quality. And actually data quality and reliability are the top problems that analysts report with data warehouses today. A second problem is timeliness and lack thereof. Every ETL steps adds a delay before data is available in the warehouse. Um, and surveys show that at least 80% of analysts are working with stale data in the data warehouse, often weeks or months out of date. That obviously leads to a bad experience for them as well. And then the third one is high cost. You've got constant ETL and duplicated storage uh, that's more expensive to manage. So these are the trends motivating the lake house. The lake house is a kind of design that goes back to having only one storage tier. And the idea is to uh, implement data warehouse and management and performance features on top of these directly accessible data in open file formats that are in a data lake. So it looks as follows. So at the bottom, you've got your data of any type. You put it in data lake storage, and you still use these open formats like Apache Parquet. But instead of having applications access these, these files and, and operate on them independently, you add la a layer in front that implements management and performance features. So for example, this layer can track which files are part of a table version to implement versioning, uh, or it can implement caches and uh, indexes and other features to enhance performance. And on top of this, you have a SQL API, or you have direct access to the data files for advanced analytics. They can just ask which files are part of a table version and read them directly. 
So this design um, obviously is, is a lot simpler to use and it would be great to run all the applications on top of it, but it also gives up a big uh, piece, a big element of the design of data warehouse systems, which is full control over the storage format. Now the storage format becomes part of your API and it becomes something fixed that you can't change. So the question is, can we still get state-of-the-art performance and governance features with this design? Uh, we believe that you can. And in particular, we see three technology trends that are uh, making the lake house design successful. First, metadata layers that do the management part are already widely used for data lakes and they add transactions and versioning. Second, there are lake house specific query engine optimizations that are giving great SQL performance with this design. And finally, there are even better interfaces for data science and ML that further improve performance there. So let me explain metadata layers. So with a, a data lake, normally it's just a collection of files and you can't uh, do things like version your data set or have transaction. There's no isolation between applications. But metadata layers are this new kind of system that tracks which files are part of a table version in an ACID manner. And you can use this to implement rich features like transactions and data versioning. And clients just ask the layer, hey, which files should I look at to read this particular table version? They get back a list and then they can directly access it. So we've implemented this at Databricks with Delta Lake, which is open source. Uh, Netflix uses a, a Apache Iceberg for the same purpose. Hive also has something, Hive Asset that does a similar thing. And these are quickly becoming the standard for managing data lakes. At Databricks, over half our workload, exabytes per day at thousands of customers is using Delta Lake. And we've also seen integrations with all the major ETL and data warehousing vendors. So it's really becoming the standard uh, when you think about data lakes that they have these features. But metadata management alone is not enough. You also need to get good performance. And that's where we think that new, uh, that a specific set of optimizations for Lakehouse can give you that. Um, and these, these are optimizations that work even with a fixed directly accessible storage format. So first there's caching hot data in memory or SSDs. You can do that of course, and you can even transcode it into a fast format. And this allows you to match data warehouse optimizations on hot data. And second for cold data, even though you don't control the format, you can control the data layout within files. For example, sort them to cluster co-access to records. Um, and you can also build auxiliary data structures like statistics and indexes that you maintain transactionally with your data files. And these allow you to minimize the IO for cold data, uh, which is usually the dominant cost and to match the kind of IO cost that a proprietary engine would have. Together, these features let Lakehouse engines achieve pretty competitive performance. Just as an example, um, we compared Databricks Delta engine, which is a native engine uh, for Spark SQL that we're developing with four of the leading uh, cloud uh, data warehouses on TPCDS. And you can see we're competitive uh, with the fastest one of these using similar hardware. So we think at least today, there's nothing stopping Lakehouse from being competitive with today's cloud data warehouses. And then the final, uh, interesting trend is machine learning over a lake house. Um, so ML frameworks already support reading Parquet, ORC, and so on. And there are also now uh, increasingly declarative interfaces used for IO in these that enable further optimization. For example, Spark's data frame API translates to relational algebra. So you can um, look at the query plan and start using indexes, caches, and other features of Delta Lake to select which data you want to read and further improve performance there. So putting all this together, Lakehouse systems combine the benefits of data warehouses and lakes and also simplify enterprise data architectures overall. And we think that they'll take over in the industry over time because most enterprise data is already in lakes and it's very easy to add these features on top and start getting great performance and management on top of them. Uh, finally, for researchers, we think this has some interesting questions. Um, for example, you could uh, think about how do we design a next generation lake house system? For example, how do you design an even better open data format than Apache Parquet? And there's probably a lot of interesting research to be done in solving that problem if this is gonna become part of our data systems uh, public interface. Uh, and also you can rethink existing data management research. For example, if you're working on data integration or quality assurance or poly stores, what if you could directly access 
the, the raw storage files inside each of the database systems that you're trying to integrate? How would you design the system separately? Um, and similar thing with, um, if you're trying to do advanced analytics, you know, don't push them into SQL, just try to run them directly on these open formats. So it's quite a bit of work to be done uh, in all these areas.